Um, hi, and thank you for joining us. Um, I am sorry we're starting a little bit late. I feel there is a breakfast session that we tried to wait for for people to trickle back in. Um, but um, I think room's starting to fill out now. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, the conversation today uh, will be, I think, a highly engaging and highly interesting conversation around um, accountable tech, accountable board boardrooms, um, and to um, sort of help us um, set the conversation, uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us. Um, we, right at the end, I will start is Dr. Rai, who is the distinguished fellow of the Observer Research Foundation and former national security advisor. Um, then we have um, um, Ap Apar Gupta, I think, uh, the executive uh, director of the Internet Freedom Foundation, uh, Paul Kadaria, distinguished fellow in global innovation at the University of Toronto, uh, Aditi Kumar, the executive director of the Belfer Center um, in the US, um, and Richard Verma, the vice chairperson of the Asia Group, uh, former US ambassador to India. Um, I will, um, you know, you can read the description of the panel, but I will sort of open up uh, the, conversa the conversation with a question to the panel. Is, um, is the fact that we are seeing um, sort of greater privatization of, um, in the tech sector, not tech sector, it's fairly privatized, but the greater move of public good uh, being privatized in tech, is this a new, uh, development, or have we seen this in other sectors before? Um, don't know whether anyone wants to jump in and sort of kick us off. Go ahead. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see everyone. Um, let me also say that I, I'm now the vice chairman of the Asia Group, and we've been very proud to have a research partnership with the Observer Research uh, Foundation. Uh, Samir and I are going to talk about the report that we've written on uh, digital crossroads, which we'll talk about a little, a little bit. A lot of these issues are actually covered in our, in our panel today. Um, the, the topic about accountable tech and accountable boardrooms and your question specifically, Kai, I want to, I want to tackle it, but I just, I do want to take a step back and having served in government for many years, and I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Rai, who uh, when I was serving as ambassador, we signed the first ever cybersecurity sharing agreement between the United States and India. And hopefully one of the things we'll talk about here today is how to get that agreement um, up and running again. But let me, let me just tell you what I'm seeing and why we're even diving into this question about, you know, the, does, does basically the private sector have a set of public responsibilities? That's how I hear your, hear your question. What I've seen is that the power of governments is diminishing across the board, and the power of technology companies is increasing, and we are becoming increasingly dependent on technology in every aspect of our life. That's what the last three days of this conference has been about. That's what the last nine years of this uh, conference has been about. Um, our lives have become more efficient, they have become cleaner, they have become greener, they have become healthier because of, of technology, ubiquitous in everything that we do. The, the question is, does that come with a certain set of responsibilities? Should it come with a certain set of responsibilities by the private sector? There are two underlying assumptions in this debate. The first is that corporations and that the private sector are driven exclusively by profit and that therefore they can't have any set of public responsibilities. And the second assumption is that governments are inherently going to do the right thing and serve the public interest. And I think we just have to challenge uh, both of those assumptions up front. Because I, I don't think you can be a successful corporation, at least in the United States, and focus exclusively on profit maximization. You now have a set of public responsibilities, depending on your size and scale and scope of what you, uh, what you offer to the public, 
And you're, if you're not going to take on those public set of responsibilities voluntarily, governments are going to step in and compel you to take those responsibilities. So that's, that's very kind of theoretical, but the debates that we've been talking about here over the last two or three days are very practical. And what is it we're trying to solve for? Well, we're trying to protect the public, and so there's a law enforcement uh, angle to this. We are trying to protect people's privacy. There is a huge privacy element to this. We are trying to prevent misinformation and cyberbullying. We are trying to prevent the theft of, of information. Um, we are trying to prevent smaller players from being disrupted and, and being, um, you know, having competition law being manipulated. So there's a, there's a lot of responsibilities which we have as governments and, and having been in government, not been able to properly regulate and get our arms around. And so we look to the private sector entities and we say, what are you doing? And this is the debate we're having. And these are the lines we're trying to draw. We haven't drawn them cleanly in the United States. The debates are ongoing in India. You see them in the newspapers and in the parliament uh, every day. Uh, and to answer your question directly, Kaya, these are not new debates. We've seen this in, in, as society develops, we've seen these lines being drawn uh, when automobiles were first developed, when the printing press was first developed. We've seen this whenever we have an emerging disruptive uh, powerful tool at our disposals and we tend to find the right place to draw the lines. I'm not sure we found the right place uh, to draw the lines yet, and that's why we're all here trying to figure out where those lines should be drawn. Go ahead. <clears throat> See, I, I'll just take it up where Mr. Varma has left uh, there, or Mr. Varma started there. Whatever we are seeing, the private sector taking a lead uh, is a natural phenomenon. Anything which touches the consumer life across the board, government, consumer, industry, which certainly will take a lead and will become the more powerful kind of a thing. Yeah. And the tech is one such sector which is cutting across and touching everybody's life there. And I can give you n number of examples how uh, this thing has evolved over a period of a time. So as the tech has brought innovations as well as disruption in almost every sector, almost every activity, so, so is the case in this transformation from the government to the private sector also there. The, the innovations has changed the business model, revenue model, the way you act, the way you configure, because you require a quick response time to handle that. And I think that is uh, the government lethargy or the government response time is world over, not only in India, India is more, but world over, I think that is a factor also which is uh, going towards the private sector aspect there, the government. And then the second, the other aspect is that it's no more a manufacturing, it's a service is also there. Any manufacturer or the product is also a service provider there. And the service is becoming a very, very, it requires a different kind of a response time, different kind of a handling there. And I think the, uh, the government sector world over, not only in India, is will we'll, uh, we'll find difficult to handle it and natural process will go to the private sector there. This I feel, I mean, if you look at the China or if you look at the Russia also, the same thing is happening, maybe in slightly different fashion or different way, but this is the trend which has to follow. Thank you. Thank you, do you, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll add a few thoughts. I think the, the framing that um, you put forward, Ambassador Verma, is exactly right. I think there is a tendency to, uh, to go to the extremes that either the private sector has all the answers um, or that it is a villain. And I think that binary view is obviously very simplistic. Um, you know, I went, to, I went to school here down the street at Sadar Patel. Back in, and I don't think this has changed, but back uh, in India, you know, 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to get a good, a good education, going to a public school was just not an option. The private sector was stepping in to fulfill a real need and continues to do that in the education sector. We've had these debates on, you know, what is the optimal solution 
uh, in many other industries, including transportation. I mean, I'll give you another example. You know, when Uber came on the scene, one of the criticisms was that it was going to disintermediate public transportation systems. Um, but the reason that Uber, uh, the market need that it was fulfilling was actually a monopolistic um, taxi medallion system in New York City where the city was releasing about 10 to 15,000 of these uh, taxi driver's licenses and these immigrant communities, principally immigrants, were taking on um, these uh, loans that they could not afford to be able to participate in the system. And what Uber did was it broke up this very monopolistic and predatory taxi medallion. And so I think that there are uh, obviously, uh, there have emerged from the private sector and specifically the tech sector um, solutions that have been very valuable for the public good. The question now that uh, we're in a system where the, especially in tech, the platforms have amassed increasingly more power and it's a structural power because of the debates that we're having around data. It's structural power. So how is the public sector going to respond to that and put guardrails around an industry um, that by and large has delivered a lot of, uh, a lot of valuable services uh, to the community? That's a good point. I think maybe even before we go to sort of the, the big, the power of the sort of big platforms, I think the point around Uber and sort of disruptive business models, um, I think it's, it's worth noting, but then also I think building from that, uh, you know, does, does a company that sort of creates disruption that is unprecedented, and you don't, you don't really know the impacts on, of, of what are the responsibility of those companies? You know, is it just the profit motive? We've seen the, um, the I think the business round table about a month ago, sort of the, this is a group in the, of big companies in the US sort of pointed out that profit is not their only motivation, investors, customers, um, you know, sustainable development were all issues that were raised. But we, are, is, it, does it go beyond this? How, how do we hold them accountable? And also, how do we hold them accountable globally? I think the, the, folk, the, the business roundtable text actually says, you know, American customers specifically, but these are global companies. So how, how do we make sure that, you know, I'm Slovenian, that this is the same is true with India, and the same is true in Slovenia? Well, I'm not sure there's a global solution. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, you've got any company operating internationally has to respect the laws and regulations of where they're operating, where their customers are. Um, that, I think, is probably why we're having this debate, because attitudes about privacy, about data protection, tend to vary in all of these disruptive uh, areas, whether it's uh, Uber or Facebook or any of the other companies that are platforms that have a physical presence or a political presence that, you know, you, uh, in Canada, for example, in the elections that we're having now, uh, Elections Canada has rules that required Facebook to take down some of the advertising. That this is, and, and the agreement was very clear uh, to the platforms, if you print a political ad, if you put up a political ad, you have to say who paid for it, and you have to take it down if it's a lie. Now, the impact of that was that some pretty outrageous political ads got taken down. The unintended impact was that none of the public interest organizations working on the environment were allowed to put up advertising on Facebook. Because Facebook said, well, we're not sure that Elections Canada permits that on our platform. So that we're getting into, you know, and if you try to do that in the United States, well, heavens, you know, Trump puts an ad on Facebook, Elizabeth Warren puts one up that says, you know, it, it was a lie, and I wanted, I dare Facebook to take it down. Facebook didn't take it down. So different, I think that we have to identify the geographic peculiarities when we're talking about how platforms or technology is permitted to uh, operate, even if it is a multinational corporation. So is regulation the only way? So can I, can I just add to that? So I, I think, I think we do need a, a global set of standards. Now it's gonna be very difficult because obviously uh, we're not gonna be in alignment with every country in the world, but certainly couldn't democracies and couldn't the United States and India as the two largest democracies 
have a set of common standards. Um, I don't think that's a difficult thing to aspire to. Certainly, it, you know, we're talking about a lot of different subjects here, but when I think about data, for example, when I think about the, the cross-border flow of data, should there not be a global standard on that? I think about, you know, the airplane that I arrived on here late last night. Um, there wasn't a unique set of rules for India or a unique set of rules for the United States. There was a global set of rules and understanding about how that airplane could take off from the United States, what kind of fuel it could carry, how it could cross over other territories, and how it could land here. And we have this incredibly interdependent system. Now, I'm putting a 20th century construct on a 21st century uh, technology, but it seems to me we need a global understanding of how we can move data, for example, uh, to benefit people and to um, improve their uh, lives. Now, we're going we're gonna to draw lines slightly differently. S speech, for example, in India is going to mean something different than mm -hmm. speech uh, in the United States. And those are what individual societies have to wrestle with. But I think I, I'm not opposed to uh, exploring at least global constructs and global norms, and I actually think we're headed there. I just want to comment on one other thing which you said about holding public companies accountable or private sector accountable. I think we need to hold governments accountable as well. And the, again, challenge the assumption that the governments are always acting the right way and in the best way for their publics and in the most informed way. I look at some of the questioning that our members of Congress have done of tech executives. They had absolutely no idea of what they were asking or what they were saying. So how do you, you know, I, I really put that more on our government than I do on the tech industry. I think we have to hold our governments accountable to really understand um, how to coexist with these modern technologies and how to do, uh, this is a bit of a catchphrase, that the ultimate public-private kind of intersection, again, about serving the public good. Mm -hmm. And I will both, and then I'll get over to you, but I think build, building on that, I think, you know, you're, you, you almost posted in terms of democracies, that democracies are a very small proportion of countries around the world, that, uh, and so the public can only hold that many accountable. So what do you do when there is no mechanism such as that? Just to add to this conversation, certain basic underlying sentiments which are right now prevailing in India. Uh, India has arguably the largest number of users of global technology platforms, which is also then reflected in government demands for local incorporation of some of the larger global platforms having entity structures which are decision making within India. This is a present proposal which is there under the information technology intermediaries rules and for most people who do know how intermediary liability exemptions operate uh, they essentially give a large amount of legal immunity to global tech platforms for the user generate content which is created around it now there are also regulatory demands which are made quite often from misinformation abuse as well as the is a large part of the laundry list with Rich talked about. The tension which is occurring quite often, and I think this complements a lot of the themes the panel has talked about, is when the company does incorporate itself locally here in India, will the demands that are made to it be within a rights-based framework? Will it be within the purview of the constitutional values of the Indian Republic, or will that represent another extension of political interest or uh, extension of government power. So unfortunately, quite what happens is, as much as we should demand accountability from governments, accountability from platforms, it does not serve ultimate users itself. Because it turns to be uh, a, a conversation about friction between both and the regulatory solution, which is quite often proposed by government, it's towards clawing back more power towards itself without delivering that level of responsibility or addressing the underlying social need or redressing the social injury which is caused 
through a rights-based framework. So with that, I'll just end this intervention right here. See, I'll just uh, go in a uh, slightly uh, different, uh, higher perspective. There is often a debate between the multilateral and the bilateral kind of a approach. It goes on. And uh, with my long ex uh, stint in the government, I have not come to any clarity, uh, either from any sector, government or there, where, which is the best model. Some people say bilateral is better. That's why it goes on. But India has a different, a, a unique kind of a position, and we have all a unique position, and we call a minimum common program there, among our political parties there. Today, issues are becoming so geopolitical interested uh, things there. To me, it appears that uh, every country has, even the democracies have their own larger interest there. The best thing will be to evolve, uh, divide everything into two uh, layers. One is the common minimum kind of a thing, which should be agreed. And then there is a second layer, which can go on, and you may discuss and consider each other geopolitical kind of a things there. Now, if you look at the, if apply the principle to the privacy aspect there, India has a different privacy, and a privacy largely depends on the cultural aspect of the particular country or particular region there. So, but the basic principle is there, whatever information which, leakage of information which can cause a damage or a loss, no one will like to disclose and will like to keep that. Larger, I mean, I think that one. In India, we used to feel very proud declaring our name, father's name, or all kind of a thing there because that was the, our identity and we were getting benefit, not social from there. But those parameters in today's digital world, technology world, have changed drastically there. Today we are looking more at financial parameters or, or other parameters which are becoming more important. So the, I think the, I mean, somewhere we need to agree to some common things where we should include in the common privacy framework. Can we not have like a ancestral law e-commerce? The UN created ancestral law, it's a model law they created there. Can we not create a kind of a ancestral law in a privacy which is creating a lot of problem? I mean, localization, that kind of thing is creating that. Can't we create that kind of a higher, broader framework and everyone fits into that, recognizing the common minimum parameter and go through, go through that. And the best thing, I mean, we all know from our day-to-day -day experience is that the best thing works, relationship work, if we are sensitive to each other there. So if the private sector and the governments are sensitive to each other kind of a requirements there, I think that will function better. Governments should see the private sector should not unnecessarily get to a loss. They get to a revenue because they have to invest plow back. No one is giving like a public taxes to the government. So they have to plow back. So the government has to see that they earn the justified kind of a revenue and a profit and that's why they will survive. As well as the private sector has to see that they are not infringing or disturbing the social order which the government is supposed to maintain, the fabric, the just community, it should, not make, it should not disturb there. I think if we agree to the principle and we can agree on a common uh, things there, uh, uh, to me it appears that's the best way to go through that. I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the idea of let's have minimum standards, but you know, I think we need to, like, we, we operate in a world where minimum standards vary geographically. And I think we have two examples in the last couple of weeks. Um, an athlete tweets something. Okay, First Amendment rights where the athlete lives, where his employers are, and where their primary form of business is. Uh, he tweets on a platform that isn't even available in the country that objected, who decided to take those games off television. All right, so where's the minimum standard that we would apply to that particular expression of that particular individual's expression of free speech? Um, on the question of minimum standards, you know, I, I, I think Richard and I probably flew here on an airplane made by the same company. Um, that company has, I don't know how many hundred of its aircraft grounded worldwide in a situation where the company made engineered unsafe airplanes, certified internally under a regulatory body that those aircrafts were safe to fly, um, didn't 
disclose one rather important platform feature of the airplane, didn't put it in their training manuals, and then when two of them go down, they blame the pilots. And the board, the culture of that company, is, well, profits are important, we don't care about culture. But this is an airplane, as like any airplane, that requires, on, requires worldwide agreement on what a standard is, or acceptance that one regulator will sort of make the call, and other regulators will read that view and say, that's fine. So you know, where is the model that we would apply to tech platforms, given that in the case of free speech on a platform, we seem to have different, different views of what's OK. And in the case of an important 20, piece of 20th century technology that we regulate in a certain way, we've written a, a sort of major problem of both engineering and corporate culture. So where's the minimum standard, and how would we get to one for tech? So if it's not regulation, um, if it's not sort of a global sort of harmonization approach, um, what is it? Is there an earlier intervention almost? Or like, how do we encourage platforms, tech companies, other companies, to be honest, to behave responsibly? What's the answer? Well, first of all, I don't think we should give up on regulation or yeah. give up on globally coordinated regulation that makes sense. Uh, you know, I worked on the on the financial crisis shortly after the entire world blew up, and you know we talk a lot about first mover advantage in the tech sector. There is also first mover advantage in the regulatory sector, right? Yeah. If you come out, uh, in this case, the U.S. came out with very stringent financial regulations, and because we're talking about a global multinational industry, that ended up setting the standard for uh, other countries and for multilateral institutions. I, I, you would say that the same is happening now in the tech sector with Europe putting a stake in the ground with GDPR, which, you know, if you're a multinational company and you're implementing all of those requirements, then you're kind of hoping and at this point lobbying for other governments to standardize and harmonize their regulation yes. with Europe's. Um, China has put a stake in the ground with its, with its cybersecurity law. And so I, I do think that there is um, ground to be found, but I, I think governments have to be thoughtful, but they have to move fast. If India wants to get into this conversation, then they should move fast and put out proposals so that we can debate them so that you know, the, uh, the companies are not already entrenched in other, other countries' regulatory systems that they then hope will be harmonized at a global level. Uh, but of course, regulation, I don't think, is, is the only um, answer. I mean, one major area and, and the topic of this panel is accountability in the boardroom. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems in tech companies now is the, is the all-powerful CEO, is the role of the charismatic CEO. And, uh, you know, these, these CEOs have come along, they've created something big, they've created it fast, and so investors have put a lot of faith in them to go on creating those returns. And one enabling mechanism in all of this is the multi-class voting structures that all of these tech companies have. And so, you know, for, for Facebook, for example, it's impossible for the board to fire Mark Zuckerberg. It is impossible. He has 51% control, and he can actually fire anybody on the board of directors without cause. The same thing happened with WeWork, which they hastily had to correct over the past couple of weeks. Initially, Adam Newman's voting power was 20 to 1 relative to the common stock. The same was true of Travis Glanick in Uber. And so when you think about um, what companies can do internally to hold themselves accountable, you should start with this idea that the leaders of the company who took the company from you know, zero to the IPO are, may not necessarily be best place to take it from then onwards to serve mm -hmm. the public good. And so how do we create structures, and specifically one-to-one -one voting structures, so that we can um, hold those leaders accountable when they're not serving um, the good of the company and the good of the public? Is that also just a question of maturity? You know, how old, how old is the company? How long has it been yes. around? Yeah, I think partly, but you know, so this all started, I think, with Google. Google was the first company to come out an IPO uh, with a 10 to 1 uh, voting structure. Uh, that structure exists today in the company. Right now, 40% of tech company IPOs have this structure relative mm -hmm. to, I think, 15% in, in non-tech companies. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's something that, that changes over time, but you know, it hasn't changed in Facebook. It hasn't changed in Google. It exists in most tech companies uh, around the world today. So, uh, 
just like to add here, we're also looking at how American companies are operating, which are the dominant platforms at present, but in future what you'll also see are companies which are emerging uh, both in India but also from China, and I would like to put that on the table. Uh, first thing with companies which are based in India, which are privately held, largely privately held, have not been listed publicly, it's the venture capitalists who are holding most of the voting rights there. I think there's some superstructures for voting rights which are retained by founders, but by and large founders are not having the high level of authorities and control uh, on a larger basis. Some do have it. Uh, you can notice a certain amount of even practical difficulty having diversity when the growth stages of the company are being administered and when it stabilizes and it's pre-public at that very stage because you do need an operational team which is unfortunately homogeneous, comes from the possibly the same engineering school, has a high degree of trust between them, has taken the same level of risk has a great level of emotional bonding. These things just happen and then are then subsequently reflected in the boards until ho how long the company ages and the board becomes more diverse. So I think those conversations need to start here in Indian companies mm -hmm. as well. That's one. The second thing is with respect to Chinese companies. How are they structured? What are the controlling structures? Who owns what? What are their boards? How much do we know? And that's where I'll stop. I, I think Apar makes a very good point that um, you know, Indian capitalism with its board that's all been to the same school may eventually say, oh, we've had a crisis, maybe we need to do something about the board. I'll leave that to Indian capitalists and investors to worry about. But as China's uh, heft and footprint in the global economy increases, particularly with corporations that really aren't independent, you know, where the diversity is, are you a party member or aren't you a party member? I would be very concerned about acquisitions by Chinese companies in the tech industry and elsewhere about the lack of transparency in how those companies uh, have their performance measured when they make a direct investment in a foreign company and what, it, what sort of clout they expect. Uh, it's, you know, perhaps as long as Mark Zuckerberg controls the board of Facebook, we don't have to worry that Chinese companies will come in and try to buy Facebook and try to control it. At the same time, there are lots of other startups, lots of other innovation platforms in the tech industry where one could imagine that opaque Chinese ownership could come in and we could find the platform doing something quite different from what the founders of the platform thought because the money had different goals when it came in to buy initially a minority stock. So I think that that ownership question and the diversity of the ownership also is going to vary depending on where the money comes from. Yeah. And we need to, let, like, let's, you know, let's, let's be real clear that, you know, we had our era where the Japanese were bad, we had our era when the Americans were bad, like, there are always eras where some investor is bad. And we learn from those, and maybe we need to learn again in the tech industry that it's a completely different set of issues about what tech platforms do compared to what car companies or office buildings in Manhattan are like. See, uh, the tech kind of a innovation and revolution as well as evolution and the disruption, a different corporate governance is emerging and my view is that it just started, we cannot say which is good, which is bad or what is going to evolve there. The average life of the company somewhere in maybe say 2000, uh, uh, 2050 or 60 or 70 was almost 33 years. Okay? It came down to uh, 19, uh, 19, so 1980 uh, or so something, it came down to uh, somewhere around 27 years. The life of the company, average company, tech company is not more than 10 years now. That is what the things have changed because of the innovations and kind of things. The, I think the boards are also becoming charged with that because they have to realize the investment and everything they have to do that. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if the any company is uh, have come to some surety that how the uh, corporate structure will evolve. I think it's going a lot of uh, change, uh, evolution going on, maybe next two, three years, some clarity may come up there. The, what I agree with Apar, but 
See, the Chinese model itself is changing a lot. It's changing a lot. Any international pressure, they try to uh, change the things. Uh, it goes right at the corporate level because today everything is globally connected there. So I feel this is a time where a lot of transition is taking place and the next two years will tell us how mm -hmm. things will happen there. The, if you look at the philosophy of one of the social media, which is quite in the media nowadays, because of what we have seen in the last couple of years, the fake news and the other posting there, their own corporate philosophy structure also has changed there. there. So I think that is an evolution which is taking place, maybe another two, three years, give a little more clarity how the things will become. But one thing is very, very clear, and the boards are also very clear, that they have to adopt the tech, they have to use tech as a main strategy. Strategy, that is very clear. The role of the CTO and the COO, which was about 20 years, two separate roles were there. Now they are merging together. They are merging, CEO and CTO are merging together. So tech, both the, all companies, whether it's a tech company, not tech company, I think technology is going right up to the board because they have to devise their own business strategy. The revenue model, whether they are dealing tech or they are not dealing with tech, but tech is influencing because it has become an important fabric of the entire operations, other activity there. So I think we are going through a transition phase. Next two years will tell us how do we, uh, how the corporate structure will look like. It. Can I just also say, we're, we're, we've talked about governments, we've talked about corporations and boards. I think we should also spend a few minutes talking about consumers and uh -huh. constituents and, and whether we all have responsibilities as consumers of, of that information and users of, of that technology. And I think uh, companies and governments need to hear from ordinary people and from civil society about exactly what they are concerned about. They are obviously concerned about how their information is being used. They're concerned about the information that's coming at them. Is it accurate? As consumers and as constituents, we have power. But we've got to use that power. We've got to educate ourselves. We've got to be able to turn off things that are corrupting our societies, our communities. We've got to be able to not purchase things that add to uh, kind of the disinformation or manipulation in the tech space. We've got to hold governments accountable when they do things. Uh, you know, right now, let's be honest, there's a certain partnership between a lot of governments and tech on misinformation, and it's not just in authoritarian uh, places. And I think citizens need to really draw the line. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think we just put the burden on on uh, corporations to do the right thing, they need to hear from their customers and consumers as well. Mm -hmm. And I would, and then I will open it up to sort of probably a couple of questions from the audience as we go into the last ten minutes. But uh, like before I do that, I want sort of building on that. You know, we've also seen um, pressure groups sort of start uh, putting uh, emailing, sending letters, tweeting at investors that invest in some of the more shady sort of surveillance type companies. Um, is, is that something that we should be also thinking for, you know, more traditional, traditional, uh, the, the more mainstream tech? Should, should there be pressure on investors rather than just board members, rather than just companies themselves? You know, I think when you think about a corporate structure, you think about the employees of that corporation, you think about the management, you think about the board, and you think about the shareholders and you think about the investors and obviously the, the customers. I mean, there's a whole ecosystem right. that makes a company run. And companies have a certain personality, they have a certain profile, they have a certain public record. Right. And I think the more we, we know about the different facets of particular companies, I think it's, I think it's really important. I, I think holding them accountable is, is, is what they what they would expect and should expect. Okay. Well, and, and okay. pressure on investors, you know, most investors are institutional investors in pension funds. So I'm not quite sure how you exactly do that unless you are a pensioner or maybe an owner in the shareholders, in, in the institutional investor, the hedge fund or whatever. How, like, tweeting at an investor, well, what am I gonna do, tweet to uh, Mr. Schwartzman? No, but I will say the investors 
are particularly aware of social impact issues yes. and public good issues. I mean, I, I think you can't walk into one of these large, um, either California pension fund or the yes. Canadian pension fund. Absolutely. The number of people examining the kind of public profile and public aspects of their target investment is really impressive and, and I think quite admirable, actually. No, but that's the institutional investor. I absolutely agree with you that um, particularly the public sector pension plans, which are huge, are investing in a whole lot of things because they need returns, but they are also conscious of you know, captive carbon assets, things like this, saying, hmm, that 50-year investment in Royal Dutch Shell might not be a good investment for our pensioners. So sort of how you move from there to a more general feeling, transfer that over the consumer side, other than I'm not going to buy anything with palm oil. Well, it's a long set of things, and maybe that'll eventually get the pension plans to say, we better not buy any shares in companies that are making mm -hmm. their money from palm oil, for example. And, and maybe I would I would go even like at a lower level, right? The, the tech startups and like putting pressure on like the Googles, the Microsoft of the world yeah. to to be conscious of what they're buying when they're acquiring companies. I think it could be mm -hmm. another pressure point. Yeah, and I would just add that all of this, the pressure from civil society, only works if there is competition. Yeah. Yes. And so there is still a role for government to enable startups to enter the space to ensure that customers do have a choice. I mean, no offense to Bing, but if I, you know, tried to stop using Google search engine tomorrow, my, <laughs> I don't Go know, Bing. my life would suffer, right? So there needs to be, there needs to be an alternative to, and yeah. there is some uh, policy imperative to make sure that there is one. I feel Yahoo also still exists. <laughs> duck, if, duck, you, go. if you could introduce yourself. Hello. His microphone doesn't yeah, work. Go ahead. Hi, my name is John Stever. I was uh, on the panel yesterday. I'm from Impact Hub Kigali and uh, an organization called Innovation for Policy Foundation. I wanted to return to something, Aditi, that you said in your first intervention around uh, what I would characterize as sort of a celebration of private companies solving social challenges. You referenced Uber breaking up this cartel in New York City that seemed to sort of have negative consequences on you know marginalized communities. Um, you know, and I wonder about the sort of the need for a, sort of a venture capital backed, Silicon Valley invested, sort of white male dominated company to come in and solve that challenge. And it makes me wonder about the sort of privatization of public concerns and, you know, public goods and public services. And I, you know, there, there are trends in many countries around the world. You look in Nairobi, for example, you have public roads where you have private security companies essentially barring the entrance. They're essentially privatizing policing and security. This happens in cities in like Lagos and other, other parts of the world. And so, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about how we, we sort of, want, what kind of society that we broadly want to live in. And I wanted to contrast two examples of holding big tech to account. So on the one hand, you look at this beautiful zero rating campaign launched in India, this poor internet for poor people, uh, versus how the US Congress uh, responded to Mark Zuckerberg's testimony. And you know, I, what I'm curious about, and Richard, you mentioned that essentially we needed to sort of, you put, the, you put the emphasis on consumers holding companies to account, but I'm wondering what systems are we building that enable consumers to hold companies to account? And if anyone's thought about you know, more systemically, uh, more <coughs> consultative or deliberative forms of democracy that might be able to enable consumers to more directly hold these companies to account. I hope the, the broad thread of the question was clear. <coughs> That's thank a broad you. question. And thank, thank you very I, much for the I will ask, I will get like three, cause, and then sort of get the panel to respond. So maybe you go. Hi, uh, I'm Jairus Khan, I'm with Mozilla. Um, I find it really challenging to, to hear a conversation about accountability and, and kind of disruption in Uber without recognition of the fact that when we talk about Uber disrupting the medallion system, what we're actually talking about is they're ignoring regulations. I'm from Toronto and Uber operated unlicensed in Toronto for three and a half years. They were charged by the city violating dozens of statutes. There was a half a billion dollar class action lawsuit, but they just kept paying the fines and waited out city council until an election happened and a new city council came in and passed regulations that allowed Uber to operate. So how can we meaningfully talk about accountability and regulation when many of these tech companies have more power and leverage than the bodies that are regulating them? And the third one. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ashwin from Indonesia, for the record. <clears throat> it's very interesting to 
here all of you talking about harmonization of regulations. Globally, harmonization of regulation that is very interesting, both for public and for private. Now, I heard this is discussed in many uh, conferences and seminars and workshops. This is not, uh, this is not uh, an issue for the telecommunication network because we have the ITU global harmonization system. But in the internet networks, that is not the case. We do not yet have the place where we can harmonize the regulations. Perhaps from this two year, two days conference, perhaps it is timely, again, perhaps it is timely for the ORF to make a standpoint in this issue. Now we have Mr. Gulchan Rai from the ORF, but I have also Trisha Ray from ORF and so on. Now uh, we can we can put a standpoint, perhaps something like we need a global harmonization of regulations, and in this case, perhaps UNITU is the place where we can put, discuss the global harmonization regulation for the internet network, not only for telecommunication, but also for internet network. Now, if this is basically acceptable, then we can always voice this in many occasions. Next November, we will have the IGF, Internet Governance Forum in Berlin in the middle of November. The topic is one, one world, one vision, one net. And perhaps it can be added, one GAF, global harmonization of regulations by UNITU. Bearing in mind that UNIG, the IGF is operated by UNDESA, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Perhaps ORF can even facilitate for the two UN organizations, UNDESA and UNITU, to sit together and discuss how this global harmonization of regulation can be carried out. Now, early November, we also have the ICANN meeting. ICANN is one of the ORF partners for this meeting. ICANN meeting will be, policy forum will be held in Montreal for the first, first week of November. This is the place where we can also discuss about this. So, uh, finally, of course, we will have the UN plenipotentiary meeting, UNITU plenipot meeting, and UNITU council meeting. I think it is June 2020 or so, and perhaps, but of course it's not for uh, private organizations. It is more for government organization. But in this case, we will have time for government to discuss the possibility for a harmonization of global regulation in the, in the internet network. Thank you. Thank you. And so I think we had a couple of questions. I think uh, one sort of, well, how, do, how do you keep companies ac accountable if, if they're bigger than the regulators, if they're bigger than consumers? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I quite often think that uh, not only is there a, a lack of strength in uh, regulatory institutions, there is a complete absence of them. We don't have regulators for the present and we are still building them. Uh, the second thing I would just like to point out uh, and I would like to recognize that on marginalized communities, people who do lack economic power, quite often uh, being an Uber driver is not the level of empowerment as we may imagine. It does result in wage conditions, uh, labor conditions, which are very, very uh, tough for them because it is unregulated. And when we celebrate a lack of regulation, we also need to acknowledge market failure. When people hear me speak about this, they sometimes refer to me as a Luddite, but there's been a growing Luddite movement and there's a great degree of interest in that literature. And I'll just end it with this. When we look at why the Luddites reacted and the way they did, and we read the writings around that, they were concerned not only with the complete, and they were breaking machines, um, uh, the power looms, the industrialized power looms, they were doing it not only because they were losing a way of their life, they were also facing tremendous environmental change in which there were coal power, power looms which were completely changing their environment and uh, impacting their mortality. There was an the absence of labor standards which were there. They were being overworked in factory flows. Over a period of time, what you noticed is both environmental protection as well as labor standards develop. And when there are market failures, we do need regulators for the present. However, tech platforms do offer tremendous industry, enterprise, and innovation. How can it be protected? What are better ways to look at it? And I do know, I know this for a certainty that there are enough computer product uh, designers, there are enough innovators today who do care about these issues. The challenge is, is building an institutionalized system through partnership. And it cannot be done with the sense of the state bullying them, appropriating more power. The individual and the user has to be at the center, as well as the larger ecosystem of people who are working and adding value to them. 
I just, that, that's such a, a great answer. And I, I think we're all struggling with uh, what is the line between uh, regulation and stifling innovation, protecting the consumer. Obviously, as we heard here, not all disruption is good. And how do we ensure that we're protecting the communities that we need to protect? Now, um, again, just back to my point about, about governments, we have to also, we, we can't assume that governments either A, know what they're doing or are coming in with the, with the right intent. Um, and, and so that's, that's really where, we, where consumers and constituents are really going to have to play their role as well. So I feel we're on the last 20 seconds, so I'm going to not ask any questions anymore. But um, I wanted, I, my impression is we're sort of at the beginning of the journey still. Yes. But I, I wanted to sort of invite final comments from the panel to, to sort of conclude and hopefully send us off with a positive note. I, I guess. Yeah, I think, sorry. sorry. Please, please carry on, carry Thank on. Thank you. I guess one parting thought is, I think we're all in agreement that absolutely there need to be more guardrails around tech companies at the same time that they have solved very important market needs. They've also exposed a lot of, a lot of dangers. Not to get back too much to, to basic principles, but I feel like one underlying way to achieve this is to make the public sector smarter, is to make public sector jobs more attractive to smart people so that we are attracting just as many people interested in going into the regulatory and supervisory sectors as we are sending people to the private sectors as well. I, I want to build on that and say that um, the reason that the tech companies, the big ones that aren't Chinese, get their, go to New York to get their uh, stock market valuation is because there is the perception that the public sector management of the financial industry in the United States is really the benchmark for global corporations. And the point about you need to make sure that the public sector is full of clever people to regulate these new things as they come along and to anticipate the problems I think is, is an excellent one. And that's the only way we're going to get through this mm -hmm. period of disruption to the next period of disruption. Dr. Ryan? No, I think, I mean, uh, whatever we are discussing, these things will happen because of the innovations and the disruption will happen. This will keep on happening there. India has some f uh, framework, but the uh, issues are something different. I think the larger principle, what I feel in my mind, I may stand to be corrected, is that the government has to do a minimum kind of thing there. They have to lay down the broader guidelines, broader regulations and the private sector will have to follow those guidelines and impose a self-discipline or self-regulation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they need to be accountable. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the only way I feel we can go through. Uh, but the time will tell the kind of the evolution which we are going through, transitions which we are going through. Thank mm -hmm. you. So I think you're completely right. We're at the start of our journey here. And this conversation, as many conversations as we can, will help towards that. Uh, when they say uh, we are working towards a dystopia or utopia, I prefer the word utopia, because that's the place which is idealized. But if you look at the et etymology of the phrase, it means it's not there. And it may never be there. But let's work towards a tech utopia. And I think that will happen most possibly when we center that within individual rights and a constitutional framework. And India has a great one. I would just say the more that, that governments can be talking to the private sector before there is regulation, before there is law, civil society can be a, a hugely important bridge to that discussion. And let's be honest, the, the, the government regulators don't often understand what the technologists are doing, that the technology companies don't understand the problems that the public policy professionals are facing. And those uh, sessions whether they're organized, whether they're informal, they have to happen on a more regular basis, a recurring basis, because the responsibilities in this new world we live in are a shared set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, I think that's a great point to end on, sort of the, the focus on conversation going forward and working towards utopia. And with that, I would invite you all to sort of give a round of applause to our panel for an engaging conversation.